Uh, thanks, everyone. Welcome back. My next guest is Anne Benninghoff. Uh, now, I first actually heard about and met Anne last year at ATD's DC session. Uh, if you haven't been to one of her workshops, I strongly suggest go to her on-demand talk at the virtual ATD conference this year because it is the DC session, which was by far one of my very, very, very favorite live sessions I've ever been to. Uh, so she did a session on caffeinated learning. And if you were actually in the room there, and if you watch the video, you'll see why it was called that. Not just from the atmosphere that was created, but the way it got all the learners at the table engaged really added to the overall atmosphere of the room. So what I'd like to say about it, it was practical, it was applicable. Um, now, Anne is not just an expert on caffeinated learning on these kind of practical applicable stuff, but she's also an expert in co-teaching and inclusive education. Uh, she has a wonderful quote on her website, which says that good teachers are idea collectors. And I would definitely say that in her 33 years of education experience, Anne has collected more than most and has been kind enough to share many of the ideas with you in her series of books, her talks, all of that, and is kind enough to share some of that stuff with us here today. So thank you very much for joining us today, Anne. My pleasure. Thanks, Josh. Absolutely my pleasure. So how are you these days? I'm well. I live in Central Florida, uh, so our weather has been great to be getting out and about, even with all of the crazy kind of stay-at-home things. And I look out my office window right now, just right across from me, onto a beautiful uh, protected um, marsh space. So I can see the birds flying and feel, you know, kind of some serenity in the midst of all the chaos. So I'm doing well, I'm healthy, and I am actually enjoying not having to travel places, but to be sitting at home and presenting from my home office and being able to sleep in my own bed at night. Isn't that, it's, you know, when I look at all the, the days I spent on the road last year, it is sort of amidst all the chaos and all the challenges around it, it is that that sort of, you know what? Some of these aspects I could definitely get used to. Uh, and I'm like you, I look out my window, I've got these, uh, these hawks. So I'm downtown Hong Kong mm -hmm. and we have these beautiful hawks that fly around. So they, they swoop right by eye level. Oftentimes if I'm in the middle of a session and you'll see me go like this, whoa, because a hawk just <laughs> flew right on by. But so yeah, so you're not, you're not traveling as much, but you've made the, the switch over to virtual. Uh, and honestly, some of your activities were definitely very tech savvy previously. So you've been putting out on LinkedIn as well as in your books previously and talks previously. You've definitely had a tech angle to an elements of what you've done. Um, right. In terms of taking some of the caffeinated learning materials and other materials you've created, you've shifted over a lot of them. Are there any types of activities which you found to be harder to shift over, things that you, you love doing face-to-face -face that you wish we could do better virtually, but are, are just a little bit tricky? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been doing virtual um, and online live online trainings for, uh, gosh, three or four years at least now. So the switch, um, while there has been a transition for me, it hasn't been as startling as for some. I think the piece that I'm trying to still create I don't know that it's impossible, but trying to replicate from in-person training are all of the hands-on manipulative types mm. of items. So as an example, one of the things that I often bring to trainings are these little colored chips or discs that I have people move around on a tabletop. And, uh, and there's a purpose in that in kind of forming groups of people and how would you group these and so forth. So there's a lot of physical tactile interaction with that. Um, and so I've had to think, okay, well, how can I recreate that for the virtual world? Well, on a, a whiteboard or on a Google slide or whatever you've got, I, I now have a Google slide set up that has um, 32 different colored disks, you know, different colors. And then people in a group could just drag them around on mm. the screen. And so it's, it's trying to replicate those hands-on pieces so that there's still that uh, experience, but uh, in the virtual world. And so it's working. It just takes some creativity to think, all right, there's got to be a way to do this. And, uh, you know, just trying to continually, instead of saying you can't do it, think about it. how do we do it? It's that, that mindset of there is a way to do it. Just figure it out. I, and I do. I love that positive problem solving. So for you with, you know, three or four years experience, it's more a change in, in quantity rather than, than quality so much. Uh, I mean, we look at like the ATD findings last year, they had 
10% of trainings were this live online training. This year, obviously, it's much more. So there's a lot of people in this situation where they're trying to do that recreation. I, mm -hmm. I always worry about like some of our, our, our colleagues who are like, you know, MTA learning or, or Metalogs or RSVP design where they're doing these very, very tactile things. But even on their websites, you're beginning to see that they've found ways to mm -hmm. make some of these things work. And, you know, in some ways, it's even taking it to the next level. It's not replication, but even expanding the possibilities. And I'm curious right. your thoughts on, on that, like just going beyond replication, what's gone even, even further than that? What are some of the possibilities online that excite you? Well, I, I am excited to find more ways to use tools like Miro and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to that. I'd love to find smoother ways to do co-facilitation and co-teaching uh, to make it a little even, um, I do a lot of personal co-teaching uh, and co-training with people in person. And when we're now doing it in Zoom like this, there's that touch of a lag when you're shifting from person to person. You can't just jump in quite so easily or um, do some of the annotation while one person's talking. It's a little cumbersome. And so becoming more fluid with multiple people training together, I would really like to see that, that that just that smoothness, that fluidity in the systems. Yeah, and that is genuinely a, a very big challenge. You don't have that little subtle eye contact where it's that, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's that signal you send to your partner and it's just that, that flow moment that you get into. I'm curious, so are you using any sort of like back channel with your co-facilitator or your co-teacher where just sending those little notes back and forth going, hey, are you ready? Okay, hand off now. Yes, some of that. I mean, you know, I've got when I'm doing a virtual session, I've got um, two monitors going simultaneously. I have my iPad and my phone. And so text messages back and forth from my producer or my partners, whomever, you know, coming in on the phone. So I'm trying to check that without actually looking, making it obvious, you know, trying to be a little bit uh, secretive about that so it doesn't become a distraction to others. Um, Yes, yeah, so we're definitely doing that and doing more practice than I think I would have ever done in the past because you have to uh, with that. Some of that in the past might have just been more on the spot, but now we're trying to talk it through a little bit more and make sure that it, you know, it's flowing so that it looks, you know, it has that feel to it. So it's seamless on the surface, that whole, that idea of being like the duck where it's, you know, calm and unruffled on the surface, just paddling like crazy underneath. And I, right. I think a lot of us are, are in exactly that same boat where we're getting adjusted to this new landscape. And even if we're expert facilitators, this transition requires that extra level uh, of, of very, 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 very necessary practice. Um, and, yeah. and I guess that would, to, to give advice to, to those facilitators. So for facilitating virtually, since you have had a couple more years in it, uh, even though obviously the quantity shot up, what are some of the things that you think a lot of facilitators when they're making that shift forget? Because I see a lot of really good facilitators who the moment they go online, it's just uh, panic and it goes back to like webcast webinar type talks. Right. Well, one of the things that I have learned myself over the last handful of years and particularly now is that we have to change um, the sense of a hard opening where we're grabbing everybody's attention right at the beginning and we kick it off, right? And I've always proposed that. Uh, I like that opening that's that grabbing attention, you know, and, and pulling everybody in quickly. That's how I usually do my in-person seminars. But I think about it now almost like um, if I'm trying to do a 5K race, and I want to really have a good PR or even maybe win the race in my age category, I'm not going to stand right on the start line and just take off. I'm going to run around the area in beforehand warming up. Mm. And in that warming up, I'm going to be eventually ready then to take off when the gun goes. And in person, I call this maxi mingling. It's when the presenter or facilitator is walking around the room and asking lots of good questions of people and, you know, why are you here and what is your biggest challenge and what are you hoping to learn and all of that. Uh, but I think many of us have the sense when we're in on a virtual training that we kind of keep off the video, keep off the audio. We maybe have just a, a welcome screen slide that's up. And then when the time comes, we're introduced or we introduce ourselves and we go with that hard start, you know, that, that hook. 
Um, and I've had to let go of that and realize, nope, I need to do all that 15, 20 minutes warm up beforehand and asking questions and talking to people and developing relationships as if mm -hmm. I was in the room with them. And that's been hard for me because I really like that, like that woo moment. The wow, big, exactly. Just yeah. throw them into the fire. Yeah, in a positive right. way. Right. But then you don't have any of the information that you would have been gathering from your audience from the mingling. So you lose all of that. So I've had to make that particular shift. And I think others may um, also be kind of forgetting the importance of that or struggling with that shift. Uh, the other big shift is what I'm finding in long sessions is the timing is all off. Um, if you're going to use breakout rooms and collaborative whiteboards or collaborative documents or any of that, everything takes a lot longer now. <laughs> so true. And yet, at the same time as having to slow down the content, hmm. we have to keep the pacing up or we lose people's attention, right? Because there's too many things to distract them and to multitask on. And so it's this odd balance between um, slowing down or letting go of some of the content so you can spend a little more time in the process and yet keeping it going, keeping it going, keeping it going to, because people's expectations are that behaviorally. Uh, so trying to find that balance is important. Um, and then I think maybe the, the one other thing is that um, people forget that you can still be really creative in the slideshow component. Like if you are doing some lecture, and that's maybe what you've been referring to some of the strategies that I like to use, um, that I can put up a game, uh, I can create a game or something for people to do as part of my content. I can put up really interesting, rigorous questioning techniques um, so that people are not just sitting bored and, and un in, in not interacting, you know, I can help them be competitive or, mm. or curious as part of what I'm doing. So we've got to just keep that creativity going. I, I completely agree. And definitely with the switch to virtual, I definitely have leaned a bit more into gamification uh, of certain <laughs> elements that has definitely come into play because to some extent, the way people frame it, it's, you know, it's framed like a video game. It's, it's framed in this sort of way. Uh, but at the same time, that idea of, as you said, slowing down to speed up where it's this this strange sort of balance that we need to go slower with certain elements, they take more time. But if we're not checking in more often, people are multitasking into those, those various distractions there. That's yeah. actually really, really interesting. Oh. Probably the, one of the best little tips, uh, you know, very yeah. concrete, actionable tips I can give in terms of that, that pacing and things that I'm finding is helpful is uh, when we give directions now, we have to, before going into a breakout room or an activity, we have to be very, very specific with those directions because it's harder for people to raise their hand and say, you know, what, what was that again? Or they can't easily turn to their colleague and say, you know, oh, I wasn't paying attention. What did she say? Um, like you would at a table with people. And so exactly. one of the things that I do is I, on my direction slide, so I'm actually typing the directions, posting them on a slide before sending people to the breakout room. My very first direction says, take a photo of this slide. So people can take their phone, take a quick photo of the slide so that when they do go into breakout rooms, even though I might have the directions in there too, they, they, but they're like, what do we do? Somebody's going to say, oh, I took a photo of it. And there it is. So, we, you know, we just have to think that through. It seems overkill, but it's really not. I, I com completely agree. We've got it posted on our Miro board. We send it across, especially because with some of our clients, um, we find that they're, they're actually accessing the session on their phone. So they're trying to take a photo. We, so it just becomes this, uh, they're screenshotting it and they're flipping back and forth. But absolutely, we cannot not oversimplify, but over give directions. They did that whole like study where when people make the shift in a virtual space from one virtual space to another, from the main room to the breakout room, that attentional drift that occurs there is so much more severe than in the face-to-face -face classroom. Mm -hmm. So that makes yeah. complete, complete sense to me. So uh, beyond that kind of change, which is extremely practical and awesome, are there any other changes since you've been running so many more virtual sessions recently, any other changes you've noticed in your own facilitation over the last months? Well, I used to feel like a 60 or a 90 minute session was about as long as you should ever go. 
<laughs> you know, that was just my mindset. And now I realize, no, that doesn't have to be that way. And, and of course, some of that was pushed by necessity. People are saying, no, we need more training than that. And so I, I began to realize, no, you can do an all day training. I'll actually be doing um, a four day conference uh, coming up in July and, and keeping people interactive, right? And so it's, you just have to build in lots of movement opportunities through, you know, there's lots of ways that you can build movement in. I write about this on my blog post quite a lot. Um, mm. You know, you can have people just stand while they listen to the next segment or using gestures, you know, hey, snap three times if you like that, Josh. You can have people do scavenger hunts around their space to find a photo of something that relates to the topic at hand. Um, you can have people, you know, uh, rip up a piece of paper and, uh, you know, then do something with it on their tabletop, right? Rip it up into scraps and stand and sort those and prioritize them. And, and so all of that, plus the breakout rooms and the interactive kind of co-creation documents or co-creation tasks, with that, you can go for hours on end uh, as long as you've got lots of movement and interaction in there and not just straight lecturing. So that's been a big shift for me. I'm now doing mm. these long sessions where I always just did short sessions in the past. I com completely agree with you. And it's convincing clients that that actually can be done and showing them how that actually works I think if you combine, because I, I agree with you on the physical element, uh, one of the a facilitator I really love, uh, Jimbo Clark, he says that uh, with virtual, we have to actually be more physical than we would be in a face-to-face -face session. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's actually a really, really good advice that aligns very much with yours. I think if we right. combine that with like the Miro and stuff, the visual thinking, it can really create a, a very meaningful long-term experience. Sure. I have um, a cheat sheet that I've created um, of just gosh 20 different movement things that i could integrate and i have it on my uh, desktop as i'm presenting so that if i haven't built in something very structured it can remind me right you know i and and they're simple things you know i can say hey raise the roof if you like that idea you know or my mind is heart. blown right yeah exactly. all of those kinds of things you know raise your drink <laughs> um, it's a virtual uh, cheers yeah, stomp your feet on the floor. And I don't know if people are doing it, but I've given them the opportunity, the permission, and I'm modeling it. Mm. And if we are on camera, then we see people doing it too. And, and people are more inclined to see it and do it if others are doing it and so forth. Uh, so all of those little things, again, you can't force people to do them, but you can definitely offer them the opportunity and the encouragement to do it. I, completely. And I, I love that idea of giving them permission to do it, where basically I put it out there as I'm going to continue to be ridiculous until you start being ridiculous as well, because that's how we're going to create the energy that creates a positive space here. Uh, and yeah. I, I do actually quite like that. So you've got a, a you have a cheat sheet because I have cheat sheets all around my, my edge as well. So I'm very curious. So I thought I had found all of your downloadable cheat sheets uh, with tips and tricks. <laughs> Is that on the blog as well? It is not. I, I don't always oh. post out everything that I have. <laughs> no. I would be happy to send it to you. And then oh, I'm uh, so curious. <laughs> I would be happy to send it to you. And maybe what I'll do is I'll try to go ahead and load my most recent version, right? Everything's always changing. I'm always creating new things, but I'll load my most recent version on my caffeinated learning website. And oh, then if great. anybody else is looking for it, they could find it there as well. I always love uh, my, my good buddy does the uh, one he, he's like, all right, give everybody a high five, put the high five up the camera. He's like, okay, I was also just checking that you washed your hands as well. So <laughs> it's always a good tuffle up on that. That's great. Yeah. So, so, so I mean, and I, I do recommend everybody does go to the caffeinated learning website, as well as uh, Anne's other sources and websites and gets her books, please. They're amazing. Uh, beyond that, are there any other talks that you're really looking to for the virtual ATV conference next week? Anyone that you're really looking forward to or any resource that's coming out that you really recommend that everybody take a look at? Well, I'll tell you that Tiagi, I know you mentioned him earlier to me. Uh, Tiagi has a new book um, coming out. Uh, I had a chance to see the draft of it. Did you see the live Lola book? Yes, it's the Lola book. 
So um, if you're not familiar with that, you know, anybody listening or, or uh, reading about your sessions, they should be looking for that because there's lots of great information in that, lots of great strategies. Um, so I'm going to be grilling him next. Yeah, good. And then um, I'm doing a session for L&D Philadelphia coming up next month, just a, a one hour session for their participants, their members, and I guess anybody that's interested. Uh, and then I'm excited. I'm going to be doing a training live and online certificate program in caffeinated learning um, that's called Designing and Conducting Engagement Centered Training. And that will be in October and November. So I'm excited to be involved with that. That will be my first time doing one of their programs. Oh, that's um, super so exciting. Three, yeah, it'll be three sessions, of, um, three weeks in a row, three sessions, and uh, give me a chance to get to know people and to work them through some exercises and give ideas about how to build in this kind of engagement for either virtual or in-person training. Oh. Fantastic. And we'll be putting links to all of those below the video as well uh, for people who'd like to take a look at that. Uh, last but not least, since we're coming up on the end, end, end of our call, alas, um, it went very quickly. Thank you for that. I was going to ask, since a lot of us are still on lockdown to some extent, outside of L&D, outside of the virtual learning space, is there any movie, book, podcast, etc., that you just think that everyone would really benefit listening to, watching, or reading uh, just to keep them engaged and alive and well uh, over the next coming months? Well, I've been really going back to some of Brene Brown's work. Um, I just find her, everything she says seems applicable in every situation. It's so true. <laughs> and, and so I, I've been returning to some of that over the last couple of months. Um, I'm also a big fiction reader, so I, that's mm. kind of my escape. I've been doing a lot of reading in the fiction arena. Um, and I think that's good too, just to have that break from things. Um, my family, we've been doing a daily joke exchange. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, it started back in mid-March, mid and what actually happened is I was just, it was right at the beginning of the shutdown, and, and I thought, I've got to get some laughter into my life. And so I took the whiteboard off of my office wall, and I put it out front, in, in front of my house, and I wrote a joke on it. And... So many people were walking and, and biking in the neighborhood and going past. And so a lot of people were laughing as they, I could see them smiling and laughing. And so it became a thing. And I have had a new joke out front of my house every day for almost 12 weeks now. <laughs> oh, that's spot on brilliant. And, and it's wonderful t for me because it forces me to find some, you know, and they're, they're like knock knock jokes or, you know, puns or things like that. But I get to watch everybody as they're smiling and people are stopping and taking photos of it and emailing it to someone else or oh. posting them. And, and so it's, it's kind of spreading the laughter. So anything that you can do to add a little bit of humor to your life these days is, is a good thing. Well, thank you for that, and I think that's an actually absolutely fantastic message to end on. Uh, so thanks everyone for watching. Thank you and so much for your time and for your suggestions and tips. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful time with uh, Virtual ATD next week, as well as with your upcoming stuff. And may you never run out of wonderful puns, wonderful jokes to post <laughs> in your window. Thank you so much. Thank you.